we begun a study of church history that we studied that we started rather a couple of weeks ago and uh, we're going to continue that tonight and over the next few weeks uh, I want to pick up where we left off last week and that's where the church had its beginning and that is with Jesus uh, the church is not a creation of of people uh, people certainly make up the church but Christ is the one that gives life to the church. He is the one that called it into being. Uh, we looked at Matthew 16 last week as Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says very clearly, I will build my church. Well, as we come to the book of Acts, we see what Jesus has built and given life to. Uh, the verses that A.J. just read for us describe uh, the church really at, at its very beginning. As the disciples, the apostles, uh, stand and preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And thousands of people respond. Uh, they respond to Peter's message of how Jesus came to die uh, for sinful men and how he was risen to new life. Remember, the people ask, what should we do uh, about that knowledge? And Peter tells them in Acts 2.38 that they are to repent and to be baptized. And uh, we see the evidence of that beginning in verse 41 and following. Uh, as those who accepted his message were baptized, and we're told on that day about 3,000 people were added to them. The word church isn't used, it's just the pronoun them. But it's describing the church that Jesus said there in Matthew 16 that he was building. They were added based on their faith uh, in Jesus and so we have here in these verses a description of the church. It's a beautiful description of the church. There's several words, I think, that jump out at us as we read them. First of all, the idea of togetherness. All those that had this faith were together. They were together in their worship. They were together in their study. They were together in their service as they worked with one another, took care of one another. And they were together as they went out in the community and shared what they had. Because it wasn't something that they were going to keep to themselves. It was a message about Jesus that they were going to share with their neighbors and their relatives and even total strangers. And you'll note there in verse 47, we're told every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. So they were going out in their neighborhood and they were sharing the gospel. And so we have the church coming into being. And it begins to grow as you look over these first few chapters uh, of the book of Acts. It's growing exponentially, uh, exponentially rather. Uh, we have statements like there were thousands of them. In one instance, there's 5,000. Uh, we're told that the church was multiplying. And so in the very early stages of the church, it's growing. It's located pretty much in Jerusalem. Uh, and in the areas around Jerusalem. But by the time you get over here to chapter 8, we discover that the church is growing beyond that. Uh, the church is spread to Samaria. Samaria was the region just north of Jerusalem. Uh, a group of people that were part Jewish, but also part Gentile. And the gospel was brought to them. And they responded. And so the church is growing. As the book of Acts continues, you get to... Acts chapter 11, and we're told the gospel had then gone to Antioch. Antioch is in the north of Syria, about 200, 300 miles or so from Jerusalem. And the church has its birth there and begins to grow. And from there, there are people that go out to different places uh, to take the gospel. Uh, one of those that uh, goes out from Antioch is a man by the name of Saul. We'll know him later as Paul. But he and Barnabas will go out from that church and they will go to Cyprus, first of all, the island of Cyprus, and begin to speak there and Christians are one there, a church is planted there. From there they will go up to Pisidia, which was a region of what we would now call the country of Turkey. And they began to preach there and then going further inland they came to um, Cilicia, they came to Galatia, and they began to preach there and churches came into being there. And of course, we remember the rest of Paul's life was devoted uh, to 
preaching and teaching and going different places. He was a missionary. Uh, he wasn't the only missionary, uh, but he was one of, of many. Uh, I want you to turn to Acts 8 for just a moment. I want you to notice what we're told about those that begin to take the gospel message. I think sometimes we think it's the apostles or we think it's people like Paul and Barnabas who were known, well-known, who had some position of leadership in churches. But notice what we're told initially. This is Acts 8, uh, verse 4. It says, So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the message of the good news. And then we have the idea of Philip going down to the city in Samaria. Earlier in that chapter, verse 1, we're told on that day, the day of Stephen's death, that a severe persecution had broken out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. So you have this opposition from the Jewish authorities and persecution, and you have Christians being scattered out from Jerusalem. Notice the apostles, though, stay in Jerusalem, at least for a time. We're talking about just common, ordinary people who are being displaced from their homes because they're being persecuted because of their faith, and what do they do? They don't just go run and hide. They go to new places and they take with them the gospel, and they teach others. And so the church begins to spread, not because of the apostles necessarily, and not because of people like Paul and Barnabas, but it's just regular Christians who take it upon themselves to go and share what they had found in Christ. And it gives us a model. That's what we're to continue to do today. And so much of church history was based on this. Just ordinary people going and sharing their faith with others. And that's how the church grew. I want to show you a map that I showed you last week. We ended with this map. This is a map of the Mediterranean world, basically the Roman Empire. Uh, including Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be here on the east side of the map, right there. And then you have all the Mediterranean world there. The different colors shaded on that map show you how the gospel was spread and how churches began to take plant in different places of that area. Uh, the darkest purple, this area here, is the first century. And so the first hundred years or so, first 70 years of the church, notice how far it had spread. And think about that. You know, the book of Acts begins with a group of 120 people that are still faithful to Jesus. In the days after his resurrection, in the days after his ascension back to heaven, we are told that there's about 120. That included the 11 apostles who had remained faithful, and then others that were there with them. Of course, the day of Pentecost, we have the 3,000 being baptized. Then, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have the number 5,000 given and how they were being multiplied daily. But from a relatively small group of people, that was about the year 33, 34 A.D., all the way to the end of that century, notice how far the gospel had spread. That's, that's in a day and time before automobiles, certainly before airplanes. They walked most places they went, or they took a boat that usually took them a long time to get across the, the big sea there. But in their eagerness to share what they had found in Christ, they went and shared the gospel. The other shaded areas, the second century is the, the other purple that you see there, second and third century. And you can see by the end of the third century, 200 years or so after Jesus, how far the gospel had spread. And then, of course, the yellow is a little bit later. But that speaks to something about the message that we've heard in Christ, about the gospel, how it's good news. That's literally what gospel means. It's good news. The idea that God has come into our world in the form of his son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to be a sacrifice for that, and then, then to be risen from the grave, showing us that death is conquered in what Jesus has done. That's the message that they went out and brought. And they, did, they just didn't bring it to Jewish people. They brought it to others as well. Because the gospel is for all nationalities. It's not just for one group of people, one ethnic group of people. It's for all peoples that live on this planet. 
And that's what they're doing. They're bringing the gospel uh, around. Uh, Acts chapter 13, turn there very quickly. <clears throat> I want you to notice how the, the uh, Antioch church begins this process of sending missionaries out. We don't know exactly who started the church in Antioch. It wasn't Paul, because Paul came there after the church at Antioch was already going. It wasn't Barnabas. The church in Antioch was already going before he got there. Before Peter got there, before any apostle that we know of, it was there. And so it was planted by Christians that took the message. But notice what they're told here. Chapter 13, verse 1, it says, In the church... It was at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, men like Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrenian, Menaean, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Five men there, we're told, were prophets and teachers in that church, gifted uh, with the ability to teach. I just want you to notice the names. Barnabas, we meet earlier in the book of Acts, as a wealthy Christian. He's a landowner. In fact, the first time we're told about Barnabas, he's selling his property to give the proceeds to the apostles so they can feed hunger Christians. That's the type of man Barnabas was. He was a wealthy man. He was a Jewish man, yet he's one of these teachers. We have Simeon, S Simeon, who was called Niger. The wording there basically means he's an African. He's a black man. And he is a part of this church, and he's one of the leaders that's there. Uh, Lucius the Cyrenian. Cyrenia is a part of North Africa, basically that hump of land that you see that juts out in the Mediterranean Ocean or sea, that's Cyrenia. You have another African represented among the Christians there at Antioch. Then you have a man that's named Menaean. He's a Jewish man. Uh, we're told that he's a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, Herod being among the royal family uh, that was ruling the Jews. Well, notice you have a close friend of Herod who's among the Christians here at Antioch. And then we're told there's Saul. Saul is going to be the one that very quickly uh, we're going to call him Paul. So five people that really represent a vast swath of groups of people. They're not all the same, but they're all together for the same purpose, and that is to serving God. Verse 2, we're told, as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, God speaks, basically, and says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them to. And then after they fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. So God basically speaks directly to this church, it seems like, maybe through one of the prophets, and says, I want Barnabas and Saul. Uh, they've got a mission that I want them to take. And so notice the church uh, agrees with that, and they fast, they pray, they lay their hands on them. The laying on the hands is basically a way of saying, we agree with this, we're a part of what you're about to do. And then notice verse 4, they set out by the Holy Spirit and come to Seleucia, which is there on Cyprus. Uh, they're not alone, we're going to be told here in a couple of verses that they take John Mark with them, uh, the man that writes the Gospel of Mark uh, a little while later. But that's the start of the first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas go, and John Mark goes with them. And as I mentioned a moment ago, they preach the gospel. And Christians are one, and churches are planted. Well, Paul and Barnabas are not the only ones doing this. There were others that were going out on these missionary journeys. We're not given a record of what they've done. The book of Acts basically centers on Paul and his work. But we know others went out as well. Uh, there are stories that have been passed down over the centuries about the apostles and where they ended up. Maybe you've been curious. Maybe you've heard some of those stories. We don't know how much is truth, how much is, is legend. But let me just tell you what has been said about the different apostles uh, over the years. Uh, Peter, a uh, couple of different uh, traditions about him. Either he ended up in the city of Rome and died there as a martyr, uh, in the year 64 or 65, or he ended up in Babylon. I want you to turn to 1 Peter real quickly. You'll remember this from our study a few weeks ago. Notice what he says at the very end of his letter. 1 
And this is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, actually verse 12. He says, I have written you this brief letter through Silvanus, and knowing to be a faithful brother, to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Take your stand in it. Notice what he says in verse 13. The church in Babylon, also chosen, sends you greetings, as does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. He says he's writing this letter from Babylon. He says the church at Babylon sends greetings. That's been understood one of two ways. It could mean literally Babylon, which, which I like to think that that's the case. Babylon is way over here on the Euphrates River. Basically, it's the modern country of Iraq today. Uh, there was a large Jewish population in Babel during the time of the first century. They had been there for centuries. Maybe you remember back to your Old Testament history when the empire of Babylon was strong and Nebuchadnezzar the king came against Jerusalem and conquered Jerusalem and took away a lot of captives back to Babylon. One of those captives was Daniel. Another of those captives was Ezekiel, the prophet. And so you have this large group of Jews being brought to Babylon. Before that, you had Jews being brought to Assyria uh, during the Assyrian captivity. And they were still there. Their, their descendants, rather, were still there. All of these centuries later. And so it seems, not necessarily likely, but it, it's logical that Peter or one of the other apostles would have gone to that area and preached. This morning in our study of Galatians in our Bible class, uh, Paul alludes to uh, a meeting that he had with Peter, with James, the brother of Jesus, and with uh, John, uh, one of the apostles, who he calls the leaders, the pillars of the Jerusalem church. And he says that I was sent to the Gentiles. That was my missionary, my mission. That was the mission of Barnabas, to go to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. But he says, Peter, his mission was to the circumcised, to the Jews. Well, if he indeed ended up in Babylon, that would seem logical. He's carrying out that mission of going to that Jewish population. There's another thought, though, that Babylon is actually a code word for Rome. And if you get to the book of Revelation, which is written about 30 years after Peter's life ends, John uses Babylon to speak of Rome. It's pretty clear that he does that. So some think that maybe that's what Peter is doing. That for whatever reason, he's trying to hide where he's at from the authorities, because they wouldn't know the difference between Babylon and Rome. Christians would know what he's trying to say. So that's argued, that he ends up in Rome, and that's been the the legend that's been passed down through the Roman Catholic Church, that he ended up in Rome and became what they call the first pope. There's nothing in history that supports that other than the Romans saying that that happened. Uh, you come to the end of the first century and there are claims in some writings of men that were in the church at Rome that Peter indeed had been there 30 or 40 years before them and had died there. Maybe, we just don't know that. The New Testament doesn't tell us that. He ended up somewhere. He didn't just live his life uh, not doing something. He, he went out and preached the gospel. Whether that was Babylon or Rome, we don't know for sure. The book of Acts, the last reference we have to Peter, is Acts chapter 15. And he's at Jerusalem uh, where this great conference is held to, to debate what's going to happen to these Gentiles that are coming into the church. That's the last reference we have to Peter other than the letters that he writes at the end of the New Testament. Uh, we don't know exactly where he was, but we know he was somewhere. I like to think he probably went to Babylon. It just sounds that that would be a, a good place for him to go. Some of the other apostles, some of the stories with them, uh, James, uh, the apostle, not James, the brother of Jesus, uh, Herod killed him. We actually have record of that in our Bibles. Acts chapter 12 describes how Peter had arrested the apostles and killed James. He had an intent to kill Peter. But Peter is rescued from jail by the Lord. 
It's, it's the story of the angel coming and bringing him out of the prison at night. So he's spared death, but James is killed. Uh, we often call him the second Christian martyr, Stephen being the first one in Acts chapter 7. And then we have James killed here. Uh, others of the apostles, John, who was the brother of James, it's thought that he ended up in Ephesus and lived a long time there. It's thought that he was the longest lived of the 12 apostles, maybe even close to 100 years old before he died. And there's a few stories, either he died naturally or he died, some say, by being put in boiling water. That's one of the legends that's associated with it. We do know that he was arrested at one time because he says that in the book of Revelation, that he was on the Isle of Patmos as the Spirit came to him and gave him the visions that he has that are the basis of the book of Revelation. Well, Patmos was a place where they would exile prisoners. And so he spent at least some time on that island. The story is he came off of that island and continued to live for a while. Uh, Andrew, uh, he's the brother of Peter. Uh, the legend about him is that he ended up in Central Asia, basically where the Ukraine is today, even over into modern-day Russia. In fact, there are Russian Christians that attribute Andrew uh, with their religious heritage. They believe that Andrew came and preached the gospel uh, in that region of the world. It's also thought that uh, he ended up in what we would call Turkey today. And the legend is that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. There's no historical validity to that other than the legends that have survived, but from the 3rd and 4th century they were saying that. Uh, Matthew, or Levi, another one of the 12, it's thought that he ended up in Persia. Uh, for a time, Persia would basically be Babylon over here. Or, and maybe together, he also ended up in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is south of Egypt, about right there. And there's fairly good evidence that that's where he would have uh, been at a time preaching the gospel. Uh, the, the Apostle Philip, this is different than the Philip that we read about in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 <coughs> mentions Philip the evangelist. Uh, he was one of the seven men chosen to take care of the widows in Acts chapter 6. He is different than the Philip who was one of the apostles, a separate person entirely. The legend around him is that he ended up in Carthage. Carthage is right there. Uh, Tunisia, modern day Tunisia is the ancient province of uh, Carthage in the Roman world. story is he went there to preach the gospel. Uh, Bartholomew, our Bibles don't tell us a whole lot about Bartholomew other than he was one of the men chosen by Jesus. It said that he went up into Armenia. This is Armenia right there. And also Ethiopia. So a couple of different places. And there's, there's some evidence there that he was active preaching the gospel. Uh, James, who we often call James the last, this is different than the first James I mentioned. It's thought that he stayed most of his time in Syria. That's Syria, that's where Antioch was, where Damascus was, and that that's where he spent his life. And by the way, each of these men, the stories are that they ended their life as a martyr. Their lives were taken, usually in very violent ways. Some were crucified, a couple were beheaded. There's at least one that is said that was burned to death. There's some very gruesome things for their faith. Some of the other uh, 12 apostles, we have Simon. Uh, the story there is that he went to Persia and died there as a Christian martyr. Uh, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, there were two Judases among the apostles. Uh, it's told that he went to Mesopotamia, which is basically the same as Persia, Babylon, Assyria, and that he died there preaching the gospel. Uh, then there's Matthias. Matthias was the man in Acts chapter 1 that is selected to replace Judas Iscariot, or Judas the betrayer. And the story on him is that he went to Syria, and his life ended there. Then there's Thomas. We don't know a lot about Thomas. The, the most... Uh, obvious memory we have of Thomas is the book of John 
telling us that when Jesus appeared after his resurrection, Thomas was not with the disciples. And he comes back after Jesus leaves and he says, I'm not going to believe unless I actually see his wounds. I'm able to touch his wounds and so forth. Well, the very next Sunday, the very next first day of the week, Jesus appears when Thomas is there with them. And we have that beautiful uh, scene of where Jesus offers his hands and Thomas immediately just falls to the ground and says, my Lord and my God. Just a wonderful statement of faith. Well, the story on Thomas is that he spent some time in Syria and ended up in India. India is about right there if we continue the map. Way far to the east. In fact, let me show you. That's an image of Thomas well after he lived. So it probably doesn't look like Thomas at all. Uh, but if you go to Google and put St. Thomas or Thomas the Apostle, you're going to get that picture of Thomas. The thought is he ended up in India. He followed the Silk Road. This map right here shows you. Uh, this red line there, that's called the Silk Road. Basically, it was a road that ran from ancient Rome all the way to China. And there was trade back and forth along that road. And so that road gave access to those lands east. And it's thought that Thomas ended up there. Uh, what's interesting is there is a group of Christians in India to this day that refer to Thomas as being their spiritual leader. Not that they've replaced Christ with Thomas, but they believe Thomas had brought the gospel to India and preached it there. Ended up dying there, they say, in the year 52. Uh, but what he began there started these communities that then began to grow. Today, there are about a million and a half so-called St. Thomas Christians. Now, they're quite different than us in, in practice and so forth. But they look back to the Apostle Thomas as being the one that first brought the message to them. And it's a group of Christians that's actually spread all over the world. In fact, Dallas and Houston both have big communities of these Christians. I didn't know that until reading that this afternoon. But they've spread all over the world. And, and the main reason I, I share with you about them, I'm, I'm not going to critique their beliefs because I don't know really exactly what their beliefs are other than they say this is how they began their life of faith with Thomas. And it illustrates for us, I think, a good point that these apostles and others from the first century, they were busy in spreading the gospel. You know, Jesus tells his disciples in, in Matthew 28 as he is preparing to leave them, he says, I want you to go into all the world. Making disciples, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have Acts chapter 1 where Jesus says something very similar. He says, you are now my witnesses beginning here in Jerusalem, then to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, he's speaking to people there that had probably not been more than 30 miles, 40 miles from their homes in their entire lifetime. But yet, what do they do by the end of their life? Well, if the legend of Thomas is true, he ended up in India, thousands of miles from his home, and he preached the gospel. Now, what's happened since with that group of people, I, I'm not exactly certain, but what I do know is he went there and preached. And I know the others of the apostles did the same thing to other places, and not just the apostles. We saw Acts chapter 8 when they were scattered, Christians just ordinary Christians went and brought their faith to other parts of the world. And so the church, church began, and the church began to grow. Well, what was it the church wanted to do as it spread? What, what was the mission that Paul and these other apostles uh, had in mind as they went? Well, as we look at Paul, because Paul's the one that we have the information on. That's who the book of Acts is primarily about. Of course, we have 13 letters that Paul wrote where he talks about what he is doing. We do have some of the writings of Peter, two letters. We have three letters of John and Revelation. And so we get some insight into what they thought was important. Primarily Paul. There's a couple of things that come out of Paul's writings. 
about what he was doing as a missionary. First of all, he emphasized the gospel. The gospel, again, being the good news that Jesus had come into the world to die for our sins and was risen from the grave. That was the message he went out with. Notice that's not very complicated. I think sometimes we intimidate ourselves into not sharing our faith because we think we've got to know a lot of stuff. It's good to know a lot of stuff, but we don't have to know a lot of stuff to teach somebody about Jesus. You know, the simple message of him coming and dying on the cross and raising from the grave, you know, as amazing as that is, that's a pretty simple message to preach. That's what Paul emphasizes. That's what he says is of, of vast importance. <clears throat> our study of Galatians is bearing that out in our Sunday mornings. You know, Paul went and he preached that gospel into these new places and people began to respond. And as people responded and the church began to grow and, and Paul left there and, and went back to Antioch, apparently there were other Christians, Jewish Christians, who decided to go behind him and go to those churches and challenge those people in what Paul had taught. And they basically went up there and said, it's not enough for you to believe about Jesus. You need to do all these other things. You need to be circumcised. You need to eat like the Jewish people eat. You need to observe the Sabbath and so forth. And they really confused the matter. And Paul writes this letter back and says, there's just one gospel. The gospel that Jesus died on the cross and that he was risen from the grave. That's where your faith is based. The grace of God covers you. You're, you're, you're God's children. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to eat like the Jewish people. You don't have to observe the Sabbath. Those are decent things if you want to do them, but they don't bring you salvation. Those are works. So Paul continually goes back to this idea of the gospel. That it's by the grace of God that we're saved. But that gospel involves more than just simply Jesus dying. It also involves the truth that it's for everyone. It's not just for the Jewish people. It's for Gentiles as well. And by the way, all of us in this room, I think, are Gentiles. Maybe you've got some Jewishness in you, I don't know. But if you don't, you're a Gentile. That's the two groups of people according to the New Testament. But the gospel is brought to everybody, and that's the other message of Galatians that we're now getting into in our study. That uh, the gospel includes good news for everyone. And so that's what Paul emphasized. He emphasizes the gospel. But he also emphasizes community. The idea that we're brought together as believers into a family. Paul usually uses the word body. <coughs> That's his term for church. He'll use the word church occasionally, not very often. He'll most often use the word body. We are the body of Christ. And I think what he means by that is a couple of things. First of all, we are, we are Christ's physical presence in this world. We are his body. That's what he means in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, when he describes the church being the body of Christ, the fullness of Christ. We're his fullness in the sense that we're here, present in this world, representing Christ in our life, in our belief, in our practice, and so forth. We're the body of Christ. The other idea of the body is that we're different parts that have been brought together. That's Paul's message in 1 Corinthians 12. How we each have our different abilities and things that we can do. We each come from our different backgrounds. But in his infinite wisdom, God has brought us together. We've been joined together. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12 says we've been baptized into one body. We've been brought into this together. So those are the two things that Paul emphasizes. He emphasizes the gospel. In other words, the grace that comes through Christ. And then he emphasizes the community, how we are to be together. In fact, when Paul criticizes people, usually he's criticizing them for tearing apart the body. People that would seek to, to uh, make the church into different parts, into different sects and groups. We're to be one, because we've been brought together by our faith in God. Notice one thing that Paul did not emphasize. I'm going to use a term here I'm going to describe to you. He did not emphasize what's often called a systematic ecclesiology. Those are words you're not going to use. I don't use them. 
Ecclesiology basically is the study of the church. A systematic ecclesiology would basically be a written description or detailed pattern of the church. There's not a book in the New Testament that could be described as a systematic ecclesiology. Now, the New Testament gives us ideas of what the church is to be, and we get glimpses of what the early church did as they came to worship, as they practiced their faith, but there's no detailed listing that says the church is to be this, this, and this. There's just not. For example, you go back to the Old Testament, you come to the book of Leviticus, it's the third book of our Old Testament. The book of Leviticus is a detailed description of what sacrifices were to be, of how the priests were to do their job. It's a detailed description of what the worship of the Jewish people was to be like. It's extremely detailed. In fact, as you go back and you read the book of Leviticus, we get kind of lost, we get kind of bored. Because it's a listing of rules. Compare that to the New Testament. Do we have a book of Leviticus in our New Testament? Obviously, we don't have a book named Leviticus, but is there a book like Leviticus in our New Testaments? It's simply not there. What I'm suggesting here is the church went out, as missionaries went out, they went out preaching the grace of God. They went out preaching the community that believers belong to. But as the church began to spread, it would be different in different places. Not different in that it was totally opposite of what another church would be. Different. We have the description of the church that we just had read for us in Acts chapter 2. Do you notice the lack of detail there? It says they were together. It says they prayed. It says they worshipped. Do we have a description of how they did that? Not really. It mentions very briefly that they broke bread. We assume that to be communion. Does it describe that communion service? Not really. Paul will go into some detail in 1 Corinthians, but the detail he gives is you need to wait on one another. He didn't talk about the actual service itself. 1 Corinthians 14 is the closest we have for a description of a worship service. What it describes there, if you have a song, get up and sing. If you have a word of prophecy, get up and speak that word of prophecy. If you have a tongue, get up and speak the tongue as long as there is somebody there to interpret. That's the detail that's given on that worship service. There's nothing more about how you structure a worship service, the order that's given, those that can serve in that worship service. It's just not there. And so you go from place to place and you see some differences. You know, you look at the church at Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem was primarily Jewish. Very few others of any difference were there. They were very tradition bound. Even in the late part of the book of Acts, Paul comes back there. They're still in the temple. That's where they're worshiping. They're still offering sacrifices not for forgiveness, but for cleansing. That's the whole controversy in Acts chapter 21. When Paul comes back to town, James takes him aside and says, we're, we're hearing rumblings that you're out there telling people that they can disregard all the Jewish traditions. And so what we want you to do so that the people in Jerusalem will accept you is we want you to take these four men over here and bring them to the temple and offer their, or have their sacrifices offered for their ritual purification. What does Paul do? He actually goes through with it. That's when he's arrested in the temple. He's bringing these four men in to have their sacrifices offered. And actually the text suggests he is the one that paid for their sacrifices. Well, what's Paul doing? Well, the early church is still as a part of that Jewish tradition. They've not broken away just yet. Now they will in time. And I think Paul expects them to do that. But they hadn't yet, so Paul's not going to ruffle feathers and, and stir the waters. He's going to go along with it. Well, you compare that to a church like Rome. The church at Rome was primarily made up of Gentiles, Greeks and Romans. We know that's the case because if you go to Romans chapter 16, there's a long list of people 
uh, that Paul mentions that he wants to send greetings to, every one of them has a Greek and Roman name. There's not really any Jews that are there. And so there's a difference there. They're not caught up in all the rituals that the Jews would have been caught up in. You go to Romans chapter 14 and 15, uh, there's a controversy in the Roman church. There's some that are insisting on observing special days. What they mean by that is probably Sabbath. They probably mean things like Passover and Pentecost. And there were some in the church that thought, well, no, we're Christians. We're not going to observe those days. Paul says, you're both right on this. Uh, don't infringe upon the freedom of the other. In fact, you'll come in chapter 15 and you'll say, some observe those days as a way of honoring the Lord. He says, don't take away from that. So notice he's acknowledging there's differences within the church there. And we could make other examples as we go through our text and see that no two of these churches in the first century were identically the same. They all believed in the Lord. They had that matter as a similarity. They believed in their faith they had all come and were baptized. That's one of the uh, uh, consistencies that we see. And that's part of this gospel message that Paul preached. That we were baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But as for how they practiced their faith on a day-to-day -day basis, there's not really a detailed list of how they did that. That's one of the ideas that Paul describes as being a, a Christian uh, freedom. A uh, couple of more things. I've already gone really long. So I'm going to end with this thought. I want you to think about it this week, and we'll pick up there next week. What would be the defining characteristics of the early church? I just noticed there's some similarities. There's also some differences. But what held the church together? And that's going to feed back into this analogy that I gave you last week that I still want you to think about. And that is if we compared the church to a business or to a business model... What would it be more like? Would it be like McDonald's? I described last week how McDonald's basically replicates itself. You go into a McDonald's here, it's going to be pretty much the same as McDonald's in Dallas or Mexico City or wherever you go, it's going to be pretty identical. So that's the idea of McDonald's. Also with McDonald's, you have a top-bottom management. Everything's decided at the top. Individual franchise owners, they have to listen to what's coming from the top. The Dairy Queen, I mentioned how that was kind of an independently owned thing, but they were connected with a common business, ice cream. In fact, one thing I forgot to mention last week, that what makes Dairy Queen Dairy Queen is a franchisee has to buy the, the ice cream product, the self-serve or the soft-serve ice cream product from the Dairy Queen Corporation. Everything else is left up to the franchisee. They can customize their business however, but they've got to have that product. That's their core business. And then the Bob's Burgers is just an independent thing. There's lots of different Bob's Burgers. They may be similar. They serve hamburgers, but there's differences other than that. And there's no connection. They're all run by different people and so forth. So think about those two things. It's kind of an odd place to leave, but it gives you something to think about this week. What are the defining characteristics of the early church? What were Paul and these missionaries doing as they went out and planted these churches? Were they going out and planting identical churches in every place, in every respect? Or was it something different? And then think about the analogy. And we'll begin putting all this together next week as we end talking about the first century. And then we're going to, from there, go into the second century and begin going down through history to our day today. So... It's a lot for you to think about tonight, and I did go way long. I apologize for that.